magnify his name. Continue to thank the Lord. Has the Lord done been good to you? Has he done any good thing to you? Thank him for the testimonies that we have received tonight. Give him all the glory for his mercies. Thank him for his provisions. Thank him for his protection and preservation. Thank you for all that he have done. Lord, we give you glory. We magnify your name. Be thou exalted. Lord, we celebrate you. We celebrate you. We declare tonight that you have done all things well for us. May your name alone be glorified. May your name alone be glorified in Jesus' precious name. Blessed Holy Spirit, thank you for gathering us again in your presence today. We ask that you have your way in our midst. As we look into the word of life, we ask that blessings will come out of the word for us. Grant us ears that hear, eyes that see, and heart that receives. May your word be fruitful in our lives in the precious name of Jesus. By the authority of your word, we ask for the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in your word tonight in the precious name of Jesus. Please, you may be seated. We want to look at loving God sure way to distinction in life. If we want to be distinguished in life, loving God is the sure way to achieve that. The love of God. For the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2. He said, but as it is written, that eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. God loves everyone, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. So God loves everybody, no doubt. But those that love God, those that love God, God reserves blessing for them. Those that love God, God doesn't joke with them. God is the creator of everybody. He loves everybody. But those that love him, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, we want to look briefly at what does loving God mean? What does it entail? Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 22 from 36 to 40. He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? They asked Jesus. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That means the standard that Jesus was trying to say it is that loving God has to be absolute. That means by his standard, you can't love God and love any other thing else. That by his standard, nothing should compete for the love of God with God in your life. That means that your life has to be completely, fully surrendered to him. He said, for you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That means there is no reservation. You don't reserve any part of your life, any part of your heart in your love for God. It has to be wholeheartedly the whole of your heart, with all your heart. He said, with all your soul, with all your mind. And these are the three makes of man. Whatever your heart, your soul, your mind. He said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. 
And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The way you love yourself, you love your fellow man, your neighbor, the person beside you. He said, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. He said, everything about the law is summarized. Everything that the prophets have been teaching is summarized in these two things. Loving God with all your heart. Loving God with all your soul. Loving God with all your mind. And loving your neighbor as yourself. Now you ask yourself, do you truly love God the way he wants us to love him? Do you, do you truly love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Because to Jesus, that is the standard. That is the standard. It's all or none law. It's either you love God with all your heart or you don't love him at all. It's either God is all and all for you or God is nothing at all to you. It's an all or none law. Loving God must be in total, must be total with all your heart, with everything about you. So when we say we love God, this is how Jesus described loving God. Everything about you. Loving God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. That means nothing comes before God in your life. So a God first lifestyle, God is the first, God is number one that matters. God is the first, God is number one that matters in everything that about you, in all that concerns you. God takes the first position. God is the priority. He's the first priority. That means you want to do anything, you say, what would God want me to do? What would God have me do? How would God want me to treat this matter? How would God want me to pursue this matter? What is expected of me by God? God's first lifestyle. So in everything, you see, the Bible said that in all your ways, acknowledge him. Let him be the first in everything. Let God know the steps you are taking. Let God knows what, cross check with him, run it with him. In all your ways, not in some of your ways, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will. Bring it to pass. This scripture, God showed me something with this scripture. You see, when we said in all your ways acknowledge God, you find out that most of us, the things that we do, we don't acknowledge God until we run into problems. Now, in all your ways acknowledge him. Let him know. Bring him into what you want to do. Let him be involved. And one thing I noticed is that anything I want to do, I have done several things. I have made certain mistakes in life without putting God first. I have taken certain steps without letting God know. And then I will run into a problem. But since I learned this scripture and learned what it means and begins to bring God in everything I do, and bring God in all, I have never failed in anything I have done with God. Now, you see, when he said, in all your ways I acknowledge him, it's a very simple thing. Just let him know, God, I'm doing this. You pray about it. Some people will tell you, you have to pray and receive answer. You have to pray and we don't want God to know. For the fact that you presented it to him, for the fact that you brought him into it is what matters. And what has happened to me, what I have learned is that over the years, when I began to obey this scripture, I noticed that even when the error, even when I'm heading to error, but for the fact that I say, God, 
this is what I am doing. He will find a way and, and route it to go the right way. Are you getting what I'm saying? Are you getting what I'm saying? That's what I have noticed. For the fact that I began to present this before him, God help me. This is what I want to do. This is my intention. This is what I'm going to do. I have always seen his hand work on that particular matter that I presented before him. So it's a risk when we try to run ahead of God, when we try to do some things without him. It doesn't take you anything to tell, bring that project, bring that program, bring that intention, bring that ambition, bring it before God. Bring that your choice before God. Thank God I trust you to lead me. This is what I want to do. But you know the right way. You see, that is why prayer, prayer is acceptance of our frailty as humans. Prayer is acceptance that we are not perfect. Prayer is acceptance that we need help. Prayer is acceptance that we are not all-knowing. Prayer is acceptance that we might think that we are going right, but it is wrong. That we are frail. You are not Alpha and Omega. Your word is not the final word. So when you come to, that's why somebody said that the proud don't pray. It's only the humble people that pray. Because the proud knows what they want to do. They already set their mind on concrete. They, they, they are, there's no need for God. There's no need for God. There's no need for God. I was talking to a younger sharp a few days ago who was believing God for marriage. I said, see, the way you are going with the kind of fear in you, you will make mistake. Because you already agitated, you are scared, you are fear. They've told you all kinds of things. I said, no, what you need to do, commit it into the hand of God. Have you prayed, is God? No. Commit this thing into the hand of God, and then every morning you wake up, tell God, I want to get married. I'm confused. Lead me. That prayer, continue to pray that prayer. If you enter a wrong one, God will bring you out. He will. He will bring you out. Before you seal it, he will bring you out. Because you acknowledged him. You brought him into it. You asked for his leading. You tabled it before him. Even though you didn't hear him. But because you have tabled that matter, you have brought that matter before him, he will lead you. He will lead you. That's my experience with that scripture. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Everything I have placed before God, I have placed before God. There is none of them that I didn't see his hand or his finger walk. Even when it seems as if it will not work, you will see him work. Like this testimony I was, uh, I was giving this evening, because it was something that would have been a very big mistake for us. But because we were praying, we were praying, we were praying, we were praying, and it was obvious, that house we will go, every Sunday we will close, from Michigan, we will go to that house. We will go and pray and anoint that house. Even when they said it has gone. We were like, this is the house God wants us to live in. How come? But the devil was orchestrating everything possible. I said, no, let's stop, let's stop, let's stop. Let's not buy again. We are not buying. I said, we are not buying. When you want to buy? Because even it was somebody that wanted to give us the money for that payment. Then he said, if, I say, if you return, what of when you say next year, will the person still give you? We said, no, let's, let's move, let's go, let's take it now. Even if later we don't, it would have been a very big disaster. It was in that thing, in that buying of that house. See, that's why prayer is very, very crucial. They started demanding, my wife, go and bring where you work in Nigeria. Ah, ah. Somebody who has left Nigeria how many years? What has, where he's working, is he still earning money there? 
They had no kind of thing. It was only the blood. Our blood, they didn't say bring. Only our blood. They didn't say bring. And all this thing was delaying, delaying the process, delaying the process, delaying the process. And this thing dragged and dragged and dragged for months. And one, they asked me to bring her. They would tell me they'll send it, it's not there. Then, but everything, what happened? One day I was just sleeping. God asked me to carry my computer. I opened my, my iPad. Ah, behold what I saw. It was that house. Back market. I said, this house? I said, I'm not sleeping again. In the morning, I told the person, you see, you see this house? He said, and then? And then? I said, I said, we are going for it. He said, no, you have gone far here. You have gone far. You lose your money. I said, money. I said, we'll lose it. No problem. If they don't give us, it's okay. Our EM, if they don't give us, it's okay. Then finally, finally, we got that house. The house was nothing compared with the one. And the one they wanted us to buy was more expensive than the one. The one they wanted us to buy was three bedroom, down bungalow. Then the one we are buying was four bedroom, upstairs. Big compound, big everything, big backyard, done backyard, backyard concreted and, ah. But we are like, ah, they will not compare. And this one was more expensive. But God finally delivered us. Why? Because we acknowledged him in that place. So it makes difference if you put God first in everything. You know, at times he will rescue you if you start going by yourself and run into problem. He will, because he's a merciful father. But it's all different, it makes all different if you acknowledge him. So how do you know you love God? God's first lifestyle. Let God come first in everything that you do. In all your way, let God come first. Let God take the first position. Love him with all your heart. Love him more than anything. Let his will, his way, and everything about God be number one. If they tell you this is how God wants this thing, give up every other thing. Do it his own way. This is how God wants you to behave. Leave every other thing. Do it his own way. This is what God said. Leave every other thing. Do it his own way. God first. God first. You will never live a God first lifestyle and meet with disappointment. You will never live with a God first lifestyle and not be distinguished in life. You will never. God will always make you a distinct person. If you make it, he said, they that honor me, I will honor. They that despise me will be lightly esteemed. But them who honor me, I will honor. God first lifestyle. God is searching for people he could entrust or commit things into their hands. People that he could trust to commit things into their hands. To commit this into their hands. And we have to answer the love question. Do I truly love God? Do I truly love God? How do I know I love God? What level is my love for God? Are there reservations? Am I loving him the way he wants me to love him? With my whole heart, with my whole mind, with my whole soul. Is that the way I love God? Is God number one? Is God priority in everything? You see, if you walk in this manner, even before you take any job, you ask yourself, how will this job affect God? How will it affect God? How will it affect my relationship with him? How will it affect my prayer life? Because I want, to come, I want to be in communion with God. God first lifestyle. God first lifestyle. And nothing any other person tells you than 
you putting God first. First before anybody else in your life. First before money. First before your job. First before even your very present life. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. He said that let our life be what? A living sacrifice. Let it be a living sacrifice. Can you give me that scripture? Romans 12. Paul said, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, he said, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, he said, which is your reasonable service. Present yourself. You see, the reason why we find it difficult to surrender our life or to do God's first lifestyle is because we have not first committed our lives to him. Our lives are not yet in his hand. Because if your life is in the hand of God, if you have surrendered your life to him, it won't be difficult to answer any call of God. It won't be difficult to please him. It won't be difficult to live for him. God's first lifestyle will not be a difficult thing. I once told you, said, the life of a Christian, the normal life of a Christian is a borrowed life. Because the life you are living is not your life as a Christian. It's the life of God that you are living. Because your own life is dead and has died. And then Jesus gave you his life. Because we are alive today in God because Jesus died. So it's an exchange. It's a substitution. It's just like now I, you are supposed to go to prison. I now came and said, okay, instead of putting uh, Dickin Francis into prison, let them put me. Let me go and serve his time. So, his, his being outside is at my expense. Are you getting it? His being a free man today is because I am inside the jail. That is the life of a Christian. You have no life Except that Jesus died and gave you his life. So, if it was to be proper things, your life is dead. You have died. You are condemned. So, that was why Apostle Paul was calling here. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, present your bodies by the mercies of God. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Even for the fact that you are living, but just having the mind and intention that you already sacrificed. You already sacrificed. I gave you an instant, uh, an analogy one time. Now, if you go and see a native doctor, those native doctors that have shrines in the village, maybe you go to consult them and they say, uh, okay, go and bring a white goat, white uh, cock, bring a white hen or something. Or bring a goat. And then you bring the goat. And then they do whatever, they do whatever sacrifice they want to do. Now, if the native doctor decides to keep that goat alive and not kill that goat, you can't be passing one day and you say, this is my goat. Are you getting what I'm saying? You can't pass that day. He say, hey, hey, that's my goat, that's my goat. You, you can't do that. Because that goat to you is dead. That goat now belongs to the shrine. It belongs to the native doctor. It's his, his intention, his prerogative that he decided, let this goat stay alive. In the villages, they have, they have some things like that. They have some goat, some cow. If you tell, they say it's, it's shrine. That means somebody sacrifices it. Even though it's living. They tell you, don't touch it to... He belongs to the more. He belongs to the shrine. And you see them, they move everywhere freely. They give them a mark. But it's a living what? Sacrifice. It has been sacrificed. It's no longer your own. Even though it's living. So what that is what Apostle Paul was trying to tell, uh, to tell them here. He said, 
that you make yourself a living sacrifice. That for the fact that you are still alive, recognize that you are dead. You have been sacrificed. So it's just God's right, God's prerogative to keep you alive. He decided to keep you alive. So honor him with your whole body. Present your body holy, acceptable to him. He said, this is your, he said, if you want to be reasonable at all, he said, that is it. To say that a believer is reasonable, that you even consider the sacrifice of Jesus, he said, that is just to say, oh, this person is reasonable. You know, when somebody is talking to you at times, uh, you say, he's not reasonable. He's not, reasonable. he's not making sense. So what Apostle Paul is saying here, if we want to make sense at all, we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. He said that is reasonable, reasonable service. So every other thing, every other service is not reasonable until this one comes first. Every other thing is not reasonable until our body becomes a living sacrifice. That's why most people rush to serve God, be doing things for God, and all that. All that is good, but your reasonable service starts from here. Until your body is presented to God. That's why he was, he was, he said, I beseech you. That means I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you. I beseech you that you present your body. I beseech you by the mercies of God. That you present your body holy, acceptable to God. He said, which is your reasonable service? That means if you are reasonable enough in your service, this is what you should do. Every other thing notwithstanding. So when you tell people, you, you are serving God, but you are not yet sacrificed. You are not a living sacrifice. No. They tell you, yeah, uh, can't we serve God anyhow? God needs people to serve him. Yeah, we are serving him now. Does God have choice? Yes, he does. Not every sacrifice is acceptable. Are you getting what I'm saying? So number two is that we must have a kingdom priority lifestyle. Kingdom priority lifestyle. If you understand this scripture in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, it will help you a lot. Because when you begin to see yourself as not owning your own life, there's nothing that will be too big for you to do for God. You will even know that the money in your pocket is God. Are you getting what I'm saying? Everything about you is God's. It's not you. A man with very this understanding Gave one analogy. He said that one day God confronted him. So he, he entered into, you know, he understood this scripture very well and prayed about it and everything. So one day he, he carried some money. He was coming out from administration. He went to go, he stopped or he saw, the, you know, when you travel some places, you see this where they are selling things in the village side, you know, on the express and all that. He stopped. He wanted to buy yam to take to the wife and, you know, Gary and us, some of some stuff like that. And then as he finished rising, he put his hand in pocket. God said, uh, what are you trying to do? He said, I want to buy yam. He said, with my money, you didn't tell me. I thought we have settled this matter. The money in your pocket is my money. Your life is my life. It's for me. You don't, you can't spend this money without letting me know. You would have told me that you needed yam. Right? Before you tamper with my money. He said, okay. Because uh, he said, but God, I need yam. He said, now you are telling me, just be going home. Be going home. He said, he just got home. Not up to two hours he got home. Somebody was lo loaded with yam like this. Where are you going? Knock at his door. He said, God told me to bring yam here. So he said, since from that day, 
He said he went to a different experience. He said he went to buy radio. Radios were to be listening to messages and all that. God told him, you want to use my money again? Is there anything wrong with it? I thought we have settled this matter. You are a living sacrifice. A living. So I just decided to live your life. You are living your life because of me. So you belong to me. Everything about you belongs to me. God told him. So what are you trying to do? Say so he wants to buy a radio. He said, you are, you, are, you, are, you are very stubborn. You don't, you don't hear. How can you decide to buy a radio with my money without letting me know? He said, oh, God, I want to buy this, da, 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 so that I can be listening to message and all that. God said, go home. Now you have told me that you need a radio. Okay. You are my own. It's my responsibility to provide for you. He said, he went, the radio he wanted to buy, somebody brought three. Three of that radio. The big one, the small one, and the handy one. Three. And said, he bought this thing to use in his house. Immediately he kept it. God said, don't open it. Take it to this man. And that was how he brought the radio. So he now put one in his living room, put one in the room, in the bedroom, then the other one handy, he carries everywhere he's going. Now, you see, so we, we really need to understand as believers, we don't own ourselves. We don't own ourselves. So you live for God and you live for his kingdom. Kingdom priority lifestyle. These is, are evidences that you love God the way God wants you to love him. Everything about you is God's. Everything about God's is you. You don't own yourself. So you must understand this as a believer. Once you come to terms with this, it will not be difficult again for you to please God. You will see yourself as a surrendered vessel. This is what God wants me to do. What is my own? This is what God wants me to do. What is my own? I am his own. He ordered me around. You, you know the, the time of slavery. A, a slave doesn't tell the master where he wants to go or where he doesn't want to go. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's the master, master that controls Say, Go fetch water. Go fetch firewood. Go do this. The slave doesn't say, ah, I'm not going. Because you understand his and his own property. But even God has elevated us. He said, I don't call you slaves, but I call you friends. I, a friend knows what his master does. You understand? But we must not lose sight that we are living sacrifice. Just like that fowl or that god that was taken to a shrine. And the native doctor decided not to kill it. And he's still moving and gallivanting everywhere. That is who we are. God just kept us alive because he has need for us. Not We are not to live for ourselves. In Luke chapter 14. Now you have to ask yourself. How do you treat God's kingdom? How do you treat his kingdom? How does his kingdom matter, matter to you? Kingdom priority lifestyle. That means God first, his kingdom first. How do you react to his kingdom? If there is conflicting interest between you and the kingdom of God, how do you react? If you need to go to a party and you need to come to church, which one will you choose? Kingdom priority. The kingdom has to take priority in the life of a believer. I've seen many people, they can't come to all night, but they can go to party all night. Kingdom priority lifestyle. I've even seen people, they will take their children. 
Little, little children that will go to school tomorrow morning. They will take them to a party and stay there at it. They, they can never come to bring those children for all night to pray. When it gets to all night, they, they, they are going to school. And that one night is Friday. Nobody goes to school on Saturday. They will still not bring. But when it comes to all that thing. Now, they are not living kingdom priority lifestyle. Are you getting what I'm saying? The kingdom of God is not a priority to them. So how do you now say that you are in love with God? That you love God. And things that pertains to God doesn't move your heart. Things of God doesn't touch you. You don't care what happens in the house of God. You don't care how anything goes. It's, you, it's none of your business. And you say that you love God. Love for God. Love for God. If there are a clash of interest with your job, with your family, with your children, with your money and the kingdom, what is your position? You see, until you are willing to sacrifice your Isaac for God, you are not yet qualified for Abrahamic order of blessings. Not by singing it, Abraham blessings are mine. Abraham was a man of sacrifice. There was nothing that was too big for him to release to God. Not even the promised Isaac. The promised Isaac that delayed for 25 years. And that was why he was blessed beyond measure. So when we sing, Abraham blesses am I, he was a man of sacrifice. So what is your own Isaac that you're hiding? You're withholding from God, even when he's saying, bring it here. Number three is placing God above all else, including yourself. Placing God above all else, including yourself. God is above everything. It doesn't matter. Placing God above all else, including yourself. God comes before you. You see, these are the things that when you see God blessing people, find out what they do. Find out the kind of life they live. Find out the kind of life they live. Find out how they treat God. Find out the place that God occupies in their life. We just celebrated Bishop Oedebo's 70 years last week. Impact. He said, United Nations, we are writing him. Commemorating with him on his birthday. Impact. But go and check out his life. Kingdom priority was where he started. Kingdom priority. There is nothing that he will need in the world today that he wouldn't have. He can't get. There is nothing. But he never started like that. It was a time. All about him was the kingdom. I remember when he said they were looking for how much. He said he dropped everything he has into the offering. And he looked at this. Pastors that were around him there. He said this is what we are doing. A time will come, you say, I, we don't know what he's using. We don't know what he's using. We don't know what he's using. He said, this is what I'm using. He said, if I had anything left anywhere, God wouldn't need to beg me to bring it out. If I had anything anywhere, he said, God wouldn't need to beg me before I, I put it here. He said, this is all. Everybody do your own. Kingdom priority. That is the only way, the sure way to distinction. You want God to distinguish you in life. The only way is to live for him. Love for God. Love God beyond measure. Let everything about you be God. Let's rise to our feet. The love for God. Love. Say you must love God with all your heart. With all your soul and with all your mind. That means God or nothing else. God number one. God can't play a second fiddle in your life and you expect to be a distinguished person in life. No. No. 
No. That was Jesus, why Jesus told them. He said, don't worry. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He said, everything that men are dying for, he said, I will drop it in your hand. That thing they are seeking, I will give it to you. They are additions. He said, don't worry about what to eat. But if God is taking care of the lilies of the, of the field, the flowers that we are today, they are tomorrow, they are no more. Then how will he not take care of you? I want you to lift up your hands and ask God, Holy Spirit, shed the love of God afresh in my heart. I was thinking I love God, but I never knew I'm very far from loving him. Help me. Help me. But the Bible says it's the Holy Ghost that shed the love of God afresh in our hearts. Ask the Holy Ghost to help you. To bring you into the place of love. Into the place of intimacy. Into the place of koinonia. Where you love God and you love him truly, truly. You can't love somebody and not know that you love him. You can't love somebody and the person not know that you are, you are in love with him or her. Ask the Holy Ghost to help you. Ask the Holy Ghost to help you. That is the secret of distinction in life. That is the secret of making mark in life. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 18, 17 and 18, I will spare them as a man spared his own son that serves him. Service is the way up. Service is the way out of frustration. Service is the way to make a mark on earth. Ask God to help you. Let the reality of the love of God, let it be done in your soul. Let God release grace to love him without reservation. Many of us claim we love God, but we don't really love him. When there is any checking, you run away. You claim you love him. When there is something to do, you withdraw. You claim you love him. That's not how they treat lovers. Ask the Holy Ghost to help you. Holy Ghost, help us. We need your help. We need your help. We want to reflect our love for God. We want it to be evident. We want to love God with all our hearts, with everything around us. Help us, Holy Spirit. Help us, Holy Spirit. We want our life to matter in the kingdom. We want to be distinct. We want to be distinguished. Oh, and it's the love for God that is the sure way. Help us, Holy Ghost. We cannot fake love. Let it be real. Let it be real. Let it be real. Our love for God and our love for his kingdom. Let it be real. He said, I have not seen, nor ears have, nor has it entered into the heart of man, that things which you have prepared for them that love you. The reserved blessings are for those that love you. That is our desire. That is our portion. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Help us on this journey. Day by day that we are going deeper and deeper and deeper. Not shallow and shallower, but deeper and deeper into intimacy. Deeper and deeper into love for God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Be thou exalted. We give you glory. In Jesus' precious name.